For the mission month today, I'll be preaching from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. And the title of my sermon is, Here Am I, Send Me. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. And I will read it to you. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell these people, Be ever hearing but never understanding, Be ever seeing but never perceiving, Make the heart of these people callous, Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravished, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as a terror beam, an oak leaves stumps when they are cut down. So the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Let us pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you burn the truth of this message into our hearts the truth that you are kind, you are loving, you are merciful to us. And I will respond to you, it's only this, here am I, send me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The narrative starts by telling us in the year that King Uzziah died. Who is King Uzziah? He is actually a good king. Second Chronicles chapter 26 details his life and what he has accomplished for Judah. Second Chronicles chapter 26 verse 4 says this, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all his father Amaziah had done. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. If you are familiar with the history of the Old Testament, you would know that sometimes there are good kings and bad kings. And King Uzziah is one of the many good kings that grew the country with righteousness and with the fear of the Lord. It was difficult to find a good king and even though King Uzziah turned against the Lord in, later in his age and became a leper, he is still a king who made Judah prosper. And against this back background, when King Uzziah, the good king, died, Isaiah ran into the temple of the Lord. Isaiah was probably terribly saddened by the passing of the great king, and he went to seek the Lord in the temple. Sometimes we need to go through difficult circumstances in life, or it takes a terrible situation or incident in life for us to go into the temple of the Lord, for us to go to the Lord and say, Lord, what is going on? Help us. And what happens when, when, when Isaiah was in the temple of the Lord? God in his magnificence and glory 
appeared in front of Isaiah with the angels crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. The angels proclaimed the holiness of God not only once but three times, amplifying that our God, the God that we worship, Yahweh, Jehovah, is nothing but the most holiest of all gods. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Every time you come in the sanctuary of the Lord, every time you come sitting down in this seat, worshipping the Lord, does the picture of the Lord sitting enthroned with angels crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Do you come to this sanctuary worshipping the Lord, looking at Him and say, My God, He is a holy God. And the only response that I have when I am in the presence of this holy God is this. Woe to me, I cried, for I am a man of unclean lips. I am ruined. I live among people unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Why do you come to worship, brothers and sisters? Do you come to worship because the aircon is nice here? Because the seat is comfortable? Because you got friends? Or do you come and worship because you have seen the Lord? You come to worship because you know He is sitting enthroned here and your only desire is just to worship Him. What did the angel do later on? The moment Isaiah saw God, he fell on his knees and repented. He realized he is ruined, a man of unclean lips. He lived among people unclean lips. And now he has seen the Lord. In the presence of God's holiness, you cannot but see the darkness within you and cry out to God in mercy. In the presence of God's holiness, everything is made transparent, nothing is hidden from God, and the only response that we can give to God is to admit that we are sinful and that we need God. But the good news is this, whenever we seek repentance from the Lord, the Lord is merciful and forgiving, and He will surely forgive us of all our sins and all our iniquities. The angel of the Lord took a, took a, took a, took a charcoal from the tongue and, and touched his lips and said, See, this has made you clean. Isaiah was made clean again. I just want us to ponder and ask ourselves, deep down in our hearts, why do we come to worship the Lord? You know, just recently I was in the APBC, the Asia Pacific Baptist Congress, and a Korean pastor came out and shared a testimony of how Korea uh, got a great revival and how it became today a huge Christian nation and the second largest missionary sending country in the world. And I find it interesting because many years back when I was in Makassar, I met another Korean missionary and he gave me his version of his story of how Korean had a great revival and became one of the greatest missionary sending country in the world today. So let me share with you these two versions. The first version was from the Korean missionary eight years ago in Makassar. He said this, one day, a uh, brother was sitting in the sanctuary, he was praising the Lord, he was asking the Lord to send him out for missions and he heard the Lord clearly that he was to be sent to Korea. So he went to print out Bible in the Korean language, he transported all in the boat and when they arrived at the Korean shore, the Koreans heard that the missionary will come and there was rumours spreading around that this missionary come to, to, to grab your children away, to take them as, as slaves and to take them away. So they were afraid. So they were all waiting at the shore with arrows of fire, waiting to shoot at the missionary and the boat. So the boat caught fire, but the missionary tried to save all the Bibles. He threw all the Bibles into the sea, hoping that he could save as many Bibles as he could. The missionary perished because of the incident, but the Koreans saw all the Bibles and they took it and they flipped open and they, and they said to themselves, Wow! 
this Bible has really good quality paper. I shall bring it back home and stick it on my wall as nice wallpapers for my house. So one of the Koreans did that. He took all the Bibles, took it back, tear the paper, stick it all on the wall as beautiful wallpapers. And daily, as he woke up from the bed, he looked around the house. What did he see? All nothing but the Word of God. Word of God speaking to him. Word of God speaking to him. And that was when the revival happened. He became the first Christian in Korea. His house became a prayer house. They started praying. They started studying the Bible. And a great revival happened. And da da, today Korea became one of the greatest mission sending countries in the world. That's the first version I heard. I thought it was a. I, was, I, thought, I thought it was true until lately I was at the APBC conference and I heard another version and this was the version. Well, a brother was sitting in the congregation, he was praying to the Lord, send me law and the Lord said, okay, go to Korea. He went to Korea with all the Bibles translated but then the people didn't like it. Okay, they thought he was trying to kidnap their children and all and so they tried to chase the missionary away but he left the Bible with them. So one of the Koreans took the Bible and said, Wow, good quality paper. Ah, I shall use it to do my big business every morning. Because at that time they, don't, they probably don't have paper to do their big business, but a good quality paper. So, so he placed it in a nice spot where he, did, where he does his big business every morning. So every morning he would go to do his big business and he would tear. One by one, it started from in the beginning, the Lord created heaven and then Ah, nice. Nice. So what do you do when you're doing big business every day? You may read the newspaper. There's nothing to do, right? Waiting for the thing to come out. So he started reading the Bible, oh. You know, he started reading it. Oh, great revival happened when he was reading Exodus. So there was a great revival in the toilets. He was doing his big business. He went around and started preaching the gospel and everyone come and believe in Jesus Christ. And there was a great revival. And Korea became the greatest mission sending country in the world today with a pastor who went around teaching the word of God without Genesis and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. He started with Exodus. What can we learn from here? If this happened in Malaysia, what would be the version? A Malaysian saw nice, beautiful paper. Ah, I shall pack nasi lemak with it. <laughs> and then every day she packed packing nasi lemak and you saw the word of God and there was a great revival in Malaysia. Amen. What can we learn from here? This is Dr. Samuel M. Moffat, one of the pioneer missionaries in Korea. And as people came to him to interview him and ask him, what is the secret behind the revival of Christianity in Korea? What is your plan? What, 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 what have you thought of that, that the people would want to come and believe in Jesus Christ? They were all waiting in anticipation as they interviewed him, waiting for a secret or a formula that they can apply in many parts of the world. And this was his response, his answer. For years, he said, we have simply held up before these people the word of God and the Holy Spirit has done the rest. For years, we have simply held up before these people the word of God and the Holy Spirit has done the rest. And you ask me, what is mission? Mission is simply going out there and teaching people the word of God. How was Korea revived? How did Korea experience a great revival? It was simply missionaries who were faithful to preach the word of God. And what is in the content of the word of God? The content of the word of God is simply this, that the God we worship is a holy God. The God who created this world is a holy God. And when you come into His presence, you will see the darkness within you and you cannot but bow in front of His majesty and proclaim that you are holy. I am nothing but a sinful man. And I need your mercies, Lord. I need your mercies. 
And what do we do when we go out with our neighbors, with our friends? We share with them what? The word of God. I trust many of you here may experience a transformation within you. You may or may not see God, but I trust that when you read the word of God, the word, the word just speaks to you as if it is living as if it is a double-edged sword, it penetrates through, through your heart, through your bone marrow, and it exposes everything that is within you. And you say, Lord, I am nothing but a sinful, wretched, and there is nothing within me but just darkness. And the good news is this. The Lord is merciful and kind and He will forgive us of all of our sins. God's way will never change. The only way to experience God's transformation is to admit that we need help from Him. And the good news is that He will be merciful he will take away our guilt and our sin will be atoned for. And this is the good news. This is the heartbeat of mission. To go out and tell the people that God loves us. He is the light in the darkness. He is the hope to the hopeless. He is merciful and He will forgive those who truly repent of their ways. But the good news doesn't stop there. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, what, did it, what does it say? The Lord God says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here, I, here am I, send me. You know, what, you know what's the sad thing about Christians today? Is that we want to stop at where we are being saved, our sin is being atoned for, and we don't want to go further anymore. We always like to stop at the part where God says, ah, your sins are forgiven, you got salvation, now you can go to heaven. And we say, okay, good, 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 that's it, fine. And we don't want to go further than that anymore. But God wants each and every one of us to go further than that. God wants to challenge us. And every day God is asking us, whom shall I send and who will go for us? What would your response be? To Isaiah, the only response is, Here am I, send me. Isaiah's response is 100% total commitment and abandonment to the call of God. He didn't, he didn't look at the Lord when the Lord asked him, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Do you see Isaiah asked the Lord, uh, Can I know where you would like to send me? And what is the 10 years plan that you have for me? Will there be enough provided for me if I follow you? What about my retirement plans? Is the people group very difficult? Are they cannibals? Are they going to attack me and eat me? Do I have to stay in a wooden hut and ride a boat with river infested crocodile? Did Isaiah go to the Lord and say, Lord, can you answer all my questions first before I say, here am I, send me? No. Isaiah didn't do that. Isaiah was so touched by the love and the mercies of God. Isaiah's life was so transformed and, and he's so changed and he has experienced the Lord that the moment the Lord asked him, whom shall I send and who will go for us? His immediate response was what? Here am I. Send me. He has already fully trusted in the Lord that what the Lord has planned for him will be nothing but out of love and out of God's good will for his life. You know, as I, as I minister to young people, I do have young people who sometimes tell me that they have a full-time calling from God. They want to go into seminary. They want to study. They want to go to missions. They want to uh, worship. They want to serve the Lord. But then, but then they say, Wait until I devise a plan 
whereby I can generate enough passive income to self-support myself in the mission field without having to rely on people's giving or beg the church for money. And my only answer to them is this, it will never work. If you want to do things God's way, then you need to do it God's way. And the way of God is the way of faith. Ten years ago, when I was doing my internship in Sabah, I had the opportunity to go into a Murut village in the interiors of Sabah, which is located by the border of Indonesia. So the only way to go there is to take a three hours boat ride. It's not really a speed boat, it's like a sampan boat. And I had to cover myself with a jacket because, I, because the boat is exposed under the hot sun. I had to cover myself with the jacket for three hours, sitting like that in the boat for three hours, not being able to move. And I remember one of the Orient Asli pastors took me and another American friend together in this ride. I was covering myself from the hot sun. I was so afraid. And guess what my American friend did? And he looked at me. Matthew, enjoy what God has created. Bus in the sun. And I was telling to myself, this is the tropical sun. Uh, okay, well. Well, he enjoyed the sun very well. But at night, he had sunburned. He couldn't sleep at all. He was whining and groaning the entire night because when his skin was in contact with the bed, he was, oh, oh. Okay. So anyway, it was, it was just so amazing that, that this place called Kampung Serudung Lao, uh, we were there, uh, they, they, they eat very simple, uh, they would go out and cash prawns, and the way they cash prawns is that they would take one of the car battery and they would connect it to a wire, and they would then, they would then put the wire into the water, you know, like, 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 like they want to electrocute the water, and all the prawns would, would jump up. And they would, get, they would get a net, and they would swing their net, and they would catch the prawns. And then they would cook it in, in water, and da -da, that is a meal for us. So I remember, after I was there for three days, we had to go back, uh, go back to Tawau. And I remember that journey. We had to start very early in the morning. It was pitch black. I couldn't see anything at all. It was pitch black. And, the, and, and the, 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 the village, the Ketua Kampung, the head village was at the back of the boat trying to maneuver the boat. And there was a boy sitting right in front of the boat and with him was a torchlight. And he had, to, he, had to, he had to light the way for the boat to go. And he had to remove all the woods or anything that he finds, branches or anything that was on the river. So that it will not, so so that the engine of the boat will not will not stop because you know sometimes you hit the wood or things like that or garbage or rubbish and things like that. And I remember it was raining heavily, and I was there only praying. But what I remember clearly was that torch light leading the way, guiding and maneuvering the boat, making sure that. Each step we take, God is watching us. And sometimes the only reason I can say why Christians dare not say to the Lord, here am I, send me, is because a lot of time we are fearful. We are fearful of the unknown. We are fearful of uncertainties. We are fearful. We do not know what will happen ahead of us. It is just pitch black darkness. But what I'm trying to say here is that God will not leave you alone in pitch black darkness. He will be the light that will guide you and lead you when you desire to obey and follow Him. And if you look at the life of Isaiah, after Isaiah said, you know, it's like a joke, right? Here am I, Lord, send me. And what did the Lord say to Isaiah later on? He said, go and tell these people, 
be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving, make, make the heart of these people careless, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And then I said, for how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitants, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tent remain in the land, it will again be laid waste. Imagine this. You go to the temple of the Lord. Wow, the Lord is awesome and mighty. And, the, and, and I say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. And the Lord forgave my sin. And the Lord say, the Lord say, whom shall I say? Who will go for us? And I say, here am I, Lord, send me. And then now the Lord says, good. Now I want to send you. You will preach to these people, but they will not hear. You will preach to these people, but they will not see. You will preach to these people, but they will never, ever understand. There will not be any spiritual transformation in their life, no matter how much you try preaching to them. How long, O oh Lord? Isaiah asked, how long? Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitants, until the houses are deserted, the fields are ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone away. And though a tent remain in the land, it will again be laid waste. You are sent out to preach to people who will never repent and you will preach until the Lord destroys everything. What would you say? Lord, I've given my life to you. I thought my goal, my dream for you is to build a mega church, thousands of people coming and worshipping the Lord. I thought when I give my life to you, there'll be a great revival, great things happening. Lord, that is not how I define success. That is not how I see my life to be. Preaching and preaching and preaching and sharing the word and caring for people and no matter how much you try doing, they are still stubborn. They don't want to change. They want to be in their own old ways. Why, Lord? God has not called me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. To God, Faithfulness is the key. When Abraham gave his life to the Lord and submit his life to God's way, what do you think he has achieved at the end of his life? One son. And the greatest test of all, sacrificing him on the mountain and the Lord provided a ram. And the Lord is my provider. When the Lord called Moses out and said, lead these people and you will go to the promised land, what happened in the end of his life? He didn't go to the promised land. He, he, he was walking in the wilderness for 40 years and at the end, he looked at the promised land and he went home to be with the Lord. When you look at the life of Jesus, how many people does he have at the end of his life? 12 miserable disciples. Would you call that a success? No, I don't think so. But what God wants from us is not our view of success. What God wants from us is faithfulness. Faithfulness to His calling. And the only reason why we are so afraid, the only reason why we are so afraid to fail is simply because we do not want to take the time to seek the Lord, to discern His will, to pray, and to know what He wants you to do in your life for Him. And that is why we, we, we shun away from those things and we say, no Lord, I don't want all that. 
Let me have my own index of what success is and let me accomplish this according to my own way. And once I've accomplished this, I will feel good with myself. But is that what the Lord wants? No. The Lord wants you to be faithful to His calling and that is what He deems success to mean. Just last Sunday, we have a, Jap- we have a missionary from Japan that shared with us and she shared with us, it took her nine months, nine months, just to, just to have her Japanese friend tell her where she actually lived, her address. Nine months of meeting up with her in the cafe, talking with her, and finally she was able to open up a little bit and say, oh, you want to know where I live? I live there and there. Nine months. In the year 2012, the world celebrated the 200 years anniversary of Adon Nitrin Justin's work in Myanmar. During his bicentennial celebration, his great-grandson made this statement. Suffering and success go together. If you go to a mission field and you are only suffering, This means that the next person to take over will experience success. But if you experience success in the mission field, this means that the person before you has suffered for the work of the gospel. Suffering and success go together. Adoniran Jasser has suffered tremendously for the gospel. He didn't get his first convert until six years later. Six years later. Imagine every month when you have to report back to your church, what have you done? And you say, I shared, but no one has come to Christ. And people at church, no, I couldn't be a church. No one has come to Christ. A year later, two years later, three years later, and your church may, may, and your church may say, ah, yeah, you are a failure in the mission field. La. Come back home. La. We're not going to support you anymore. Three years already, and I cannot see a single fruit. I cannot see even a church to be built. What are you doing there? It took Adoniran Justin six years just to get his first convert. During his life there, he endured two years of imprisonment and torture. At the end of his life, he suffered the death of seven out of his 13 children and two out of his three wives. He didn't have three wives at one time, but his wife died on the mission field and he remarried again and again. By the time he passed away, There were 74 churches and he translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into the Burmese language and it was so accurate that they use it even until today. What would you say of the life of Adon Nitrin Judson? Here am I, Lord. Send me. I don't think Adon Nitrin Judson would ever know that the life is going to go to where he has to wait six years just for his first convert, where seven out of his 13 children will perish in the mission field, where two two, two out of his three wives will also perish together in the mission field. I don't think that is what Adoniran Judson would want to look forward to. But what God desires of us, brothers and sisters, is faithfulness, your faithfulness to his calling. And the good news is this, no matter how difficult the work is, there will always be hope. Isaiah 6.13 ends with a hope, but as a terror beam and oak leaves stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. You know it's a stump, right? A stump is usually cut down, but the root is so grounded inside the soil that it's impossible to pull it out. And let me encourage you, when you are faithful in just spreading the seed, in just sharing the gospel, you are leaving stumps in the life of people. When you go into an unreached people group and you go to a place where where people are just dying and they needed the Lord, you become the stump in the land. 
And the good news is that that stump remains to become the hope of the nation. Jesus Christ is our stump. And I think Isaiah finds comfort knowing that even though I preach and share and nothing seems to work out, there is still hope. The stump, the holy seed will be the stump in the land. And one day this stump will grow, it will bear fruit, and a revival will happen. The theme of our mission month is unchanging mission in a changing generation. But what is unchanging? God's redemption. The only way to be safe is that when you see the darkness within you in the presence of a holy God and you say, Lord, I need you. God's redemption. There is no other way to be safe but by acknowledging that we need God. God's call. The only way to follow God is when you're, when you're ready to say, here am I, Lord. Send me. There is no other way to fulfill His work in this world but just by following God 100%. God's way, how would you respond? What if His way to you is a way of suffering? What if His way to you is a way where there's a lot of uncertainties, a lot of things that are unknown? What if His way to you is a way where someone may perish, your loved one may, may be taken away, so that you will experience the grace and the deep truth of the Lord Jesus Christ? God's work. What if God's work is something we cannot understand? How will you respond? And finally, God's hope. His hope in Jesus Christ. How will you respond if you have not known Jesus Christ today? Or how will you respond if you know that great hope is found in Jesus and you need to tell it to the people around you? His way is unchanging. He doesn't suit His way to suit our needs and our wants. We should change our ways to follow God. Let us pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the love and redemption that you have done in our lives. You have saved us even though we are sinful and wretched. You have given us a new life, a new purpose. And today you are here sitting and throne calling out to us, whom shall I send and who will go for us? I know that there can be many fear within us. All the unknowns, all the uncertainties, all the pitch black darkness. But I pray a lot for all my brothers and sisters here that we will be able to say, here am I, Lord, send me. And I may not know what will happen to me ahead. I may not know what the outcome will be. I may not know what you have for me, O oh Lord. But I know this one thing, that my Lord Jesus Christ will never leave me nor forsake me. He will be with me until the very end of this age. And he will lead me to accomplish 
the purpose that he has set for me to do. The heart of mission is the heart that is willing to obey our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.